And a good day to you, Explore Nation. Happy 2023. John Linsky here with Season 4, Episode 11. Yes, uh, Double Ones. Looking back with Linsky. And what a great way to start the new year with one of the most esteemed men at Columbus. Uh, a man for all seasons. You name it, he's done it at Columbus High School. It is my pleasure to an to introduce the venerable coach Butch Diano. Butch, thanks for being here today. Good morning, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, it, it's my pleasure, Butch. And uh, you represent so much at Columbus High School, and you've been there so long, 42 years and counting, that you're one of those people that they're like, like the Alpha and Omega. You've always been there. You always will be. And there's things that I don't even know about you because – you are just been there. So why don't we we start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start, obviously. And, and, and Butch, tell us where you grew up and, and, and your background and all that stuff. And then we'll trace you up to Columbus High School. Uh, basically, both my parents were born in Italy. Uh, my mom came over to the United States six months pregnant with me. Okay. We had a little stopover in New York and then ended up in Miami. So I was born here in Miami, uh, was uh, raised by two great parents, unbelievable parents. And uh, my mom and dad owned a store slash restaurant. And my brother and I, you know, like many people of the old school regime, how to start working as young as eight, nine years old to help out. Sure. And um, I uh, attended Jesu Catholic School, which no longer is a school, but is the oldest Catholic church in Day County. Yes. Then from then, I went to LaSalle High, which was a little bit of a unique experience because back then, uh, LaSalle was all boys, Immaculata was all girls, but yes. on the same campus. And I graduated from there, believe it or not, back with the dinosaurs in 1969. And uh, uh, my dad passed away in my late teens, early 20s. So I started college. I had to stop for quite a bit uh, because my mother in her later years developed epilepsy and mm -hmm. I had to take care of her because my brother had gotten married before me. And uh, I worked at Centro Mater. At one point I had both jobs, Centro Mater and Columbus. Mm -hmm. And at one point I was the basketball coach at Dearborn and eventually, I, uh, there was an opening at Columbus, Maria Rams, Foyo, and myself have been friends for a billion years. Believe it or not, she was a former athlete of mine in Jesu. She was a volleyball player. Wow. Thank uh, that, much. I know. And uh, we were friends from her youth, her family, my family. She introduced me to my wife. And there you go. When she uh, came to teach at Columbus, we stayed in touch. And I would go to many of their sporting events. And then eventually, uh, I uh, applied for a job in 1980. And there was a gentleman named Mr. Carr. I'm sure you remember him, John, or you do. You uh, no, he was before my time, Butch. Okay, well, Mr. Carr uh, was a teacher, and I guess later than normal, he applied for uh, law school. And Brother Edmund Sheehan gave me the job in January. And Flash Fernandez's mother, who was a uh, Spanish teacher in Cuba, was a tremendous help and influenced my first couple years. 
at uh, one point, uh, I was working a couple jobs and I was just coaching until I got the job here. And Brother Kevin, in my initial years, helped me quite a bit. And I became, for the first seven years, his uh, assistant coach on varsity and head JV coach. All right. Well, that's a lot of interesting stories there, including the fact that Brother Edmund hired you. The list of people that Brother Edmund hired, for better or worse, is it's quite he he's hired some characters let's just just put it that way uh and and so butch one question where did the nickname butch come from oh very interesting uh my mom was a devout catholic raised us very my brother and i very strictly in the faith my dad was an old school guy uh, his faith, we'll say, was not as strong as my mother's. Okay. But was very, very strict. In fact, I don't know how many people that would be able to say this. He fought in both world wars. And in the first world war, ironically fought against the United States because he was an Italian. They were allied with Germany. Yeah. Second world war, when he came over, he was somewhere in his 40s, and I believe, I know you could correct me or verify this, uh, when you were in your 40s for World War II, they were very desperate for numbers, so my dad never went to the front, but he had to help behind the line, so to speak, so he, you know, unofficially did fight in World War II. That's and a unique a unique distinction, Butch. That's pretty cool. Right. And uh, when I grew up, I'm sure as you well know, sort of in the same era with OB. And, you know, it was called the hippie years, the hippie generation. Yeah. And all my friends either had long hair or afros. And my dad wouldn't have it. And I think he made me get a haircut every week. <laughs> and the old flat tops, if you remember, John, when you would go into the army, you yeah. would have to get them. And they were nicknamed the Butch haircut. There, and, okay. Yeah. There and it so is. All my, all my friends who were either African-Americans or Americans could not say Achille. So one mother said, from now on, your name is Butch, which when people would come to my house to, you know, to get me and ask my parents, you know, can I go with, hang out or whatever? My dad uh, did not appreciate me changing my name, which I didn't and showed me in a very strong form that that wasn't that I was not proud of that. So that had a little bit of history. And I, my mother finally explained the whole situation because she was uh, like the Teddy Roosevelt of the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I had no idea that's where it came from. That's awesome. So while all your friends had their freak flag flying, you had the flat top. That's, right. that's, that's, that's awesome, Butch. Um, your love of basketball, where'd that come from, Butch? Uh, believe it or not, I tried out for basketball in LaSalle. I got cut. And uh, I, at one point, just loved to play pickup and everything. Uh my brother was going to Jesus school and a priest needed a coach when I was about 17, 18 years old, still in LaSalle. And uh, back then, I don't know if you remember this, John, there were very, very good sports programs called the CYO. Oh, yeah. CYO. It was everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And basically... If you were a high school football player, you couldn't play in CYO. 
but basketball, baseball, other players, it couldn't be your high school sport. So there were very good athletes in it. It was very competitive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, absolutely. I remember it well. And it was, uh, I would consider it a major notch above JV competition. But, you know, if you played basketball, you weren't as good as the normal high school player, you know, because you would have made your team then. So I started coaching uh, then, and then I coached my brother at Jesu. I started coaching basically when I was 17, 18 years old. And uh, there was a very, very, very good coach called Bill Alheim at Day North, who junior college ball was, um, back then, it was much more popular than it is now. Yeah. And uh, I took a class of his, fell in love, you know, with the coaching aspect of it. He would allow me to go to the practices, and that's when I started. You know, once you get bit by that bug, it doesn't go away. Yes, sir. It doesn't go away. So you get to Columbus, and do you remember, maybe you do, maybe you don't, do you remember your first introduction to Brother Kevin and his way of doing things? Uh, yes. You know, I was interviewed for the JV position first. We started, you know, practice schemes and, and everything. He was always a very, very good teacher of defense. So from what I knew, it was really an education to be in practices. I benefited from his practice first and then me going there. In the beginning, he was like an icon. I, uh, I just, you know, try to absorb so many of the other things that we were doing in practice. And if you remember back then, he was the AD, the coach. He had he wore many hats. Indeed. Yeah, and in the beginning, you know, it was an adjustment. You know, early on, I mean, I, I've heard great stories. Um, your, you know, introduction to Columbus basketball, you know, John Boy McVeigh after the Northwestern game. You had well, some characters back then, Butch. Well... It's funny because in the last whatever years, uh, when kids either in class or with, because I'm blessed here, I always compare my situation to a lot of my public school friends and just to be teaching here and with the caliber of kid we do have, I think sometimes we take how lucky and blessed we are to be in this school. But some of the kids every once in a while will give you a look or something like that. And after going through John McVay, Kevin McCutcheon, uh, Bass, uh, Julio <laughs> Cortez, I, I sort of look at them and I go, you know, I know guys now in their 50s that if they would walk this hall this day, you know, you know, it'd be different. So. Those guys then, but it was uh, an awesome experience. And McVeigh's one of my all-time favorite characters that uh, we shared some very good times. Yeah, he, he loves you, Butch. Uh, and so many of your players, you, you had an opportunity. I mean, and, and the basketball back then, yes, we're very, very good right now. Let's, uh, that's a given. But the competition level back in the 80s through the 90s was unbelievable. So, Butch, here's here's a random question. Who were some of the best high school players in Miami that you coached against? Uh, at the top of the list, uh, believe it or not, they won so many games, and he didn't finish so many games. But the best I ever saw in Dade County was Doug Edwards. From, no, okay, you know, I remember from, Doug. Yeah. From those dominant Miami High teams. Cesar Portillo, uh, who's now still coaching uh, at Matter, 
one of the better point guards ever, and for a while had the NCAA record of assists, was Chris Corciani. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember watching Udonis play. You oh, know, yes. He was a man. Well, I had the privilege of being an assistant coach in a Dade Broward All-Star game. And uh, the head coach and myself, we had coached a couple times before in All-Stars. And we just had a little formula. It was big to us that everybody play. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't want a kid to show up for an all-star game and only play two minutes. Correct. So Broward County, let's just say they sort of kept uh, their better players, Division One, in. And one of my fondest memories of Haslam, late in the game, his group wasn't in there, but that kid had so much pride Uh he came up to me and he goes, coach, I appreciate what you guys are trying to do. And he said to me, we're not going to let these Broward boys beat us, are we? And I went up to the head coach who were best friends. And I said, listen, I know we have this system. We got to put these guys in a few more minutes. And we went on to win the game. But here's a kid that won two, three state championships and had so much pride in him that uh, it became a personal issue. And I'll never forget that. Yeah, UD. UD's the man. Uh, yeah. um, Butch, you know, it's funny. Miami is a small town disguised as a big city. We all know that. And there's a tangential connection between you and Andrew Moran when Andrew was playing for Coral Gables in one of the most unbelievable endings to a Columbus basketball game ever. Talk about that game and how that ended. Well, it was funny. Uh, us and Gables were the two top dogs that year in, in the district. And it came down to the last game. And we always tried to be structured and run stuff and everything. We just didn't have it that night. And it's what I call the Alex Prendis miracle. <laughs> I don't know if it ranks, but we, did, we didn't run anything. Alex just got the ball, and Alan Michael Jordan just took over the game. And I even remember a couple times jumping up because I was a little bit big in structure and all that and would stand up and go, Alex, good shot, good shot, Alex, good shot, good shot. And he must have scored 13 points in a minute and 10 seconds, you know, to single-handedly win the district title for us. Yeah, that's still a sore spot for Coach Moran, no uh, doubt about that. Um you know, I, I don't want to put you on the spot because it's like choosing between your children. And I know how this is because I've been asked this before, too, about football. But who are some of your best players, guys that you just thought were at a different level during your era? And I know you don't want to leave anybody out, but, you know. Right. Well, I guess you would have to start uh, with the backcourt because Nelson Fonseca and Roly Medina – went through a three-year period that they were with me the whole time and uh, sort of spoiled me for the future because they were such good students in the classroom. And, yeah, they were, yeah. And not only good players, but they knew the game. They had a very, very high, uh, you know, IQ for uh, the game. So in the future, believe it or not, it caused a little problems because I wanted my future guards to be Nelson and Rowley. Sure. But sure. you had Eric Diaz, Luife, Andres Alfonso, uh, Ian Cummings. Oh, yeah. Yes. Some of those guys, I mean, were the center. Believe it or not, a football player, and I had two of them, who I would always say 
They can't dribble. They can't shoot. Can make free throws, but you can't keep them off the court because of their intangibles. And that's Michael Reddick and Antonio Lowry. I mean, Michael Reddick was 5'9". And if you remember, we were in that deaf district with yes. Edison Jackson, Miami. Yeah. And, and Michael Reddick played power forward at 5'9". Because he was just unbelievable. And so those are the guys that come to mind. I'm sure there's a lot more. A blessing for me is like right now, there are at least 12 of my former players that I am uh, daily in contact with that I'm blessed to have here at Columbus. And they, uh, they treat me unbelievable. I am so lucky to still have them in my lives, but those guys to be teaching with them now is just crazy. Isn't that great? I mean, that's one of the true benefits of doing what we do. You know, those relationships, you can have great relationships with students in the classroom and, 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 the, and we do, and it's great, but there's that bond between player and coach that just, it, it never, it never stops. Yeah. Right. Yeah, amen to that. Butch, what's the most important position on a basketball team? My opinion, the point guard. Okay, yeah, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, unless you have a Jabbar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, agreed, agreed. All right, so Butch, you know, as a sports guy, all of us have favorite teams, okay? But you, without question, and, and Mr. McKeon and, 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 and Mr. Trujillo, we all laugh about this. You have the most eclectic gathering of favorite teams of any human being I know. So let's start with, Butch, how in the hell did you become a fan of, of the Seattle Supersonics living okay. in Miami? Okay. To bring it back, when I was a young kid, the only – uh sports in town was um and um back then was not very good in yeah. fact to most of their games if you would go to a burger king and buy a whopper frying a coke you would get a free ticket to a um game uh, yes yes yeah yeah so <laughs> mr Rene rodriguez and i as you well know have been friends for life forever yeah and when we grew up, the only answer I can give you when we were younger and started picking sports team, I must have been a loser because Mr. <laughs> Rodriguez picked the Yankees, the Celtics, and in football, picked the Green Bay Packers and switched to the great Dolphin teams where I still don't know why I picked the Supersonics who switched to the Thunder, they won one title. Yeah. I picked the Phillies. Who, yeah, why the uh, Phillies? Why? Well, the Phillies have won two two titles, so there. And but then, why why the Philadelphia Phillies, Butch? Uh, Any idea? Well, the only player I can remember that I was a big fan of that, you know, nobody will remember him is Johnny Callison. You're right. Because Even he, I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. He was good player. He was a steady guy, a good guy. And I don't know why. Then with the Houston Oilers. Well, this I, one I, I understand. Might, yeah. Yeah. George Blanda, you know, back in the yeah. old AFL was like the, you know, sort of Michael Jordan of that era. And then I just stick with him. And uh, Mr. McKeon, Mr. Trio, and a few others remind me that two of my three teams, they're so unstable that they had to switch cities. So. Yeah, they no longer exist, Butch. Yes, but you, right. you, went, right. with, you went with them, which is really admirable. Uh, it, it, hey, everybody's got their reasons for why they like the teams they like. And I always like to ask people because it's, it's just it's, it's a fascinating, like, how the hell did that happen? Um, so but Butch, John, if you don't, yeah. John, if you don't mind me asking you, 
Mr. McKeon, who reminds me of that, how many fans do you know root for Boston for one team and New York for another? It's like it, it, it's like a Florida Panther, Butch. Very rarely seen and disappearing <laughs> rapidly. It, yeah, Mr. McKeon, he's got his quirks as well, let's face it. Uh, Butch, I do want to talk to you about the classroom because yes. you have taught – you know, gringo Spanish, as as we call it, for forever. And, you know, yes, teaching, teaching smart kids is great, okay? But when you get in there with the not yet smart or some American kid who doesn't know a word of Spanish, that's where you really earn your pay, like, like Webb does in math class with those guys. I've watched you work, okay? And you you intrinsically understand these guys are not going to be interpreters at the United Nations, okay? They're, they're just not. But you get them to learn. You get them to enjoy it. Uh, and, and I think the sign of any master teacher, they're having so much fun, they don't even know they're learning, okay? And what I love is you barely speak Spanish yourself, Butch, and yet there you are in there, throwing out puntos all over the place and everything else. Explain your philosophy, Butch, because it's awesome. Well, number one, I've been blessed, starting with Brother Marcus, to sit in on numerous Spanish teachers, going back to Flash's mom, who was a teacher in Cuba, and even now to Kenya, Anaris, people like that. So, and when you teach it every day, it becomes part of you. But the philosophy that I try to always embrace is I try to treat each kid because, believe it or not, the biggest challenge is in Spanish, you have some uh, scholars, you have some gringos, what I affectionately call, and then you have others, let's face it, that because of such a rigorous schedule elsewhere, instead of taking the Spanish S, they go here. So the yeah. challenge there, but the number one in ph uh, philosophy that I embrace is you got to teach each one separately as an individual, yet you got to hold the classroom accountable under the same guidelines, but you got to teach them like they were your own son, you know, and treat them. And they, like us, go through some tough times that many of us don't even realize. And uh, I think if you leave that door open, uh, I think it creates a very positive environment for everybody. Positive environment. Butch, I, you know, you, I walked into a lot of classrooms, let's face it, a lot of classrooms. And you can sense the vibe the aura, the second you open the door, are the kids happy? Are they scared? Is it negative? Your room was always positive. The kids love being there. I mean, you know, your classroom's the size of a shoebox, okay? <laughs> They're sitting on top of each other, and yet it's always positive. And, and I think more than conjugating Spanish verbs or whatever, they learned how to function as a unit and get along in very diverse backgrounds in your class. And, and that goes well beyond any knowledge of Spanish. Well, thank you. And I appreciate it. But if you, if we all take our time to get to know the kid, and if I have to say our number one quality here, I know we have a lot of silver knights. I know we have the very, very prestigious MOS program. But I, for some reason, have always identified with the other guys because once you give them a chance, the word you use, you find out what characters there are, but you really find out how much they have to offer in so okay. many ways. And unfortunately, some of them don't realize that if they channel that the right way, you know, what a good thing it is. So I've been blessed with that. 
Yeah, you have, and you do a great job. And then there's my favorite memory of your room is walkathon, where your classroom, as small as it is, turns into, you know, a, a New York City bodega. I mean, you can get <laughs> anything you want in Butch Diano's room during walkathon. I mean, those it is just a spectacle to watch the wheeling and dealing that goes on in there. Well, the walkathon, first of all, when it started off and we started, you know, the classroom competitions, I can't lie, the trash talking between teachers, <laughs> you know, you know, that's a blast. And then kids will say, well, uh, I like a certain candy. I like a certain ad. And then I make deals and I go, if I go get it, are you going to buy it? And they go, yes. It just snowballs, you know? And then the pizza sales at one point, I remember not ordering for my class, but for the school. Yeah. We would sell a hundred boxes a day. And the, to me, one of the funniest comments ever as a teacher is kids would pop into homeroom before eight o'clock. would say, Stiano, what's up? No pizza yet? It's eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, man. And I love it when the offensive linemen, would, the, the big guys would eat a, a pizza sandwich, a piece of pizza between two pieces of pizza. I mean, well, my there, God. There, there's one kid, and I, I it, it kills me. I don't remember his name. He was a Hispanic offensive lineman, and he would always make deals with me. So in order to move this stuff, at one point you make deals, and I would yeah. always have to save him one box for lunch. So then I'll go, I, and I would tell the kid, do you realize if you buy this for me and resell it, you're going to get in trouble? He goes, what are you yeah. talking about reselling? I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, you got to love our kids. So, Butch, your current job, it is one of the most difficult jobs at Columbus. As, as associate AD, you are literally a man for all seasons. And, and the number of things you have to keep track of in conjunction with Mr. McKeon, Mr. Marinelli, et cetera, man, you've got your notebook. You're always writing stuff down. Did you have any notion that you would become such an expert in soccer, in lacrosse, in swimming, in all of these things. It, you are a logistical master at this point, Butch. Well, first of all, I'm blessed with the coaches that I've worked with in each sport. For example, I remember my first year with George Flatus and Eric Pino, we yeah. were hosting cross-country regionals. Okay. And most of these guys uh, and all the power to the football, baseball, basketball, but I think sometimes the other sports, they don't, uh, people don't realize what a great job these guys do. Agreed. And, and uh, like Flatus and Eric just scripted everything out for me. And I said, look, do you just give me, you go coach your team. And these guys do such a good job that basically Mr. McKeon is extremely helpful in his guidance. Mr. Marinelli, you talk about a guy that does everything. I mean, he's involved in so many things. He's the voice of so many things. I actually, again, if, it, if he's not announcing it, I don't see it that important. He's that good and he's doing professional soccer now the high school state championship. So with the help that both Chris and Mike have given me, but the coaches are the key, you know, just the way they get in. And it's a very simple philosophy. I just tell them, give me whatever I can help you with. That's not X's and O's because it's a very simple philosophy. If they can put more time in on X's and O's, they're going to be a better coach and have a better program. But th these coaches, believe me, some of the things and the time they put in, they're unbelievable. Well, you're right. 
and and you're always very humble about that but nobody puts in more time than you do uh there's no doubt about it but uh, you know and it's greatly appreciated by those of us that know what you do it's it's quite something now butch i've noticed a pattern as we've been doing this every time i ask a question your response starts with i'm blessed so why don't we and you don't wear it on your sleeve and you're, you know, you're very low profile about it, but you are a man of deep faith. Talk about that if you want to. Oh, yes. I'm very, very proud of it. Uh, goes back to my mom. Uh, uh, I started going. My dad was not a faith. My mom did not know how to drive. Uh, she would put my brother and myself on a bus, on a public school bus back to where there was still time of segregation. That's how far back it went. Yeah. Yeah. And we would go downtown to Jesu. And uh, she, in the beginning, truthfully, if you look at it, bribed us because if we wanted to go eat breakfast at a certain place, you would have to go to mass. If, uh, if you became an altar boy, she would give you this. Then after a while, you know, her strong faith, you saw what an influence and what an unbelievable mother. It just became part of me. And truthfully, without my faith, I don't think I would be where I am now because uh, I just think he's the ultimate answer to everything. And whenever I've been in trouble or whenever I've needed guidance, in a very private way, go to him. And, uh, you know, he has all the answers. Yeah, even when we don't know what the question is sometimes, it's you know? Very well put, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're a devout family man. You're about to become a grandfather. That's awesome, you know? We have all grown up and grown old at Columbus. And then... And, and, that's part of the Columbus family. You've got your own family and then you've got the Columbus family. And it, at times it's dysfunctional, but uh, like all families are, but we always know at the end of the day and if things get tough, you've got people you can depend upon at Columbus. Yes, I do. I, I'm very, very blessed to have very many, like I say, my former players, I mean, with this new technology era, for example, <laughs> with Mr. Omar Delgado, Randy, yeah. and even Mundo, you talk about having uh, a strong bullpen. I can rival any bullpen in the major leagues with those three guys right there. And <laughs> that, I think this whole school starts with the top. I mean... Uh, what Dave Pugh and his administrators and now Mr. Kruchek taking over for Brother Kevin, I, I think everything starts at the top. And, for example, I the relationship I have with Mr. Pugh and so many things, I mean, every time I go to him for anything we talk about is there's never a negative vibe. There's never... A uh, way of saying, no, we won't be able to do that. His way is always, what can we do? Let's find a way to make this work. And it just rubs off on you. Well, he's the ultimate team player. Oh, yes. You know, and I do think that's where coaching, because, you know, Dave coached for a long time. When, you, when you've done that, I think you just intrinsically know how to, to work and manage people. You know what I mean? Yes, I agree with that 100%. You know, Butch, if if you were to sum up your 40-some-odd years at Columbus, how would you sum it up in a couple words? Well, i uh blessed that they hired me. You know, my <laughs> brother Edmund Sheehan maybe had a weak moment or whatever, and I was <laughs> truly blessed that he hired me. And then I think the heart of it, uh, you, like myself, have been through some very tough times recently. Some of the people that have passed away, you know, 
of Fred, uh, you know, Mr. Sanchez, and then Dave Eisenberg, people like that. But the caring that everybody takes to another level to help one another is off the charts, is really, and uh, I don't think you see that anywhere else. You know, I can't compare it, but when something happens, because I think good times, we all know how to share those. Yeah. It's tough times, and you, like me, have been through some of these, and you just see some of the unbelievable things that people did. I think that's the heart, the pulse of Columbus High. That's so well summarized, Coach Diano. And, you know, selfishly, I hope you never leave. Uh, but at some point, I think you've earned the right to enjoy life without running around unlocking gates at 10 o'clock at night because someone got stuck inside the, the parking lot or whatever. But, Butch, indeed, you are a man for all seasons. You are a man for all decades. And you're a man for all students. And uh, our respect level for you is at the utmost. And, and uh, I thank you for being my friend. Jeez, Bush, when we both started, we both had a lot of hair. That ain't, know, that, that ain't the case that. no more. No, no, I remember that. And I, and I too, John, from your the years when you were a teacher and you and Carter Burris and many, you know, helped me out to when you became an administrator that so many private things you help me. I appreciate not only what you've done in school, but your friendship. Butch, this has been, this could not have been, uh, there couldn't have been a better podcast to start the year than with you. It's been positive, uplifting, and, you know, good luck through the rest of the year. And, uh, and I will see, well, I'll see you at the Sports Hall of Fame, which I'm looking forward to as always. And from the bottom of my heart, Coach Diano, and for all of us, thank you for everything you do. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. All right, Explore Nation, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Coach Diano. Truly a great man. And we've got many, many other exciting and provocative people to speak to uh, for the rest of the year. So until next time, take it easy, Explore Nation. And as always, Adelante. Thanks, Butch. Thank you.